as far as saying this imitating of the kuffar and so on and so forth that's a very very long debate in itself what is imitating the kuffar what is meant by imitating the kuffar many things that muslims do kuffar do that's a very very long issue and i feel that we have to be very careful when speaking about those issues when speaking about those issues what's meant by that hadith anyway man tashabba bi qawm man tashabba bi qawm fa minhum hadith of ibn umar in musnad imam ahmad the authentic hadith inshallah those who imitate the people are from them and everything or that which is specific to their religion etc etc so if you have any doubt about the belly button piercing then it's best to leave it alone as the prophet some says that may ribuk ila ma la yaribuk leave off that which causes you doubt do that which is certain and sure of as far as a person gets a fatwa from someone who's qualified and it says nothing wrong with the belly button piercing as long as you're covered as long as your hijab is on as long as it's for your husband and so on and so forth and you do it then that's one thing and if a person is independent and can look into the text of the kitab and the sunnah and says i don't think there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with it then that's his own discretion well adam as for females allowed to wear makeup and pray then first and foremost if you're not in front of a man who isn't your mahram or your yani, he's not from the yani, someone that you're related to. As far as if you made wudu before you put the makeup on, something like this, you have wudu, you're in the seclusion of your home or in the sister's area, I don't know of anything from the kitab and sunnah that will prevent a woman from offering prayer with makeup on. Wallahu ta'ala alam. The question is says, is it a must or recommended to make adhan in iqama before you pray on your own without jama'ah? It is not a must to make the adhan. It is not a must. But it is surely recommended. The Prophet sallallahu said, when you make adhan and everything which is inanimate, which hears your adhan, will come and bear witness for you on the day of judgment. And also the Prophet sallallahu informed us that the shaitan, the devils, they run away from a house or a place where the adhan is called. They run away, they can't stand the adhan. They can't stand the adhan. So it is recommended? Yes, it is recommended. As for the iqama, the, the, the ulama, they differed. Some of the ulama, and this is the opinion I follow and I, I see to be the, the stronger one, that it is a must to do the iqama for every salah, whether you're praying by yourself or in jama'ah, whether you're a female or a male, it is a must to do the iqama. It is a must to do the iqama for every obligatory salah. Now, Wallahu A'lam. Question says, Assalamu alaikum ala salatu ala yameen al imami akthar ajran wa idha kanat al ijabatu kanat naam fa mad dalilu ala dharika wa jazakallahu khayran. Translate the question. It says, Assalamu alaikum, is making prayer on the right side of the imam more virtuous? And if the answer is correct, if the answer is that it is more virtuous, what's the dalil for that? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you well. Nahu naqulu qaida amma dhakra al-imam al-nawi rahimu Allah fi sharhi sahih muslim an al-ibadat bal al-amal al-sharifa fi al-nama yafdhuru fi fi'liha Imam al-nawi rahimu Allah, he gave you a very beneficial qaida. And he says the acts of worship and anything which is considered to be noble and yani, spiritual, even if it's not necessarily spiritual, just something noble, should be done on the right side or on the right hand. On the right side and on the right hand. As Aisha radiallahu anha rawat an nabi alayhi wa sallam kan hiya ajibuhu at tayammun fi ibadat, fi tarajjul, fi tana'ul, fi shahani kulli. Hadith is sahih. Aisha radiallahu anha rawat ala shay an nabi alayhi wa sallam kan hiya ajibuhu at tayammun. That Aisha radiallahu anha she narrated that the Prophet والسلام, he used to like to do things with his right hand, on his right side, in his acts of worship, tahuri, when he made wudu, when he made ghusl, when he washed, when he combed his hair, when he put on his shoes, and everything in which he did. ولم تصح على النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام والنبي عليه الصلاة والسلام مدح الذين يصلون الصفوف كما تصلها الملائكة في ذلك كلام طويل يطول لا يليق بمقامنا هذا في هذه الجلسة فنقول على سبيل المثال أنه قد صح أن الصحابة رضي الله عنهم أنهم كانوا يفضلون ميامن الصفوف لكن لا يعني هذا أن الذين يريدون يعني يصفوا عن يمين الإمام يتركوا 
يعني يصار الإمام خال فارغ كما يحصل كثير في المساجد فأنا هذا خطأ وغير مراد والله تعالى أعلم هذا باختصار شديد The answer going on because I now only answered in Arabic because the question came in Arabic we say translating what I just said in English that's the general rule with regards to the right side using the right hand using one's right side beginning with one's right side as far as the specifics of lining up on the right side of the Imam and it being a means of virtue and so on and so forth there's different views with regards to the people of Hadith regarding the narration that states that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels send prayers upon those who are on the right side of the Imam many of the ulama of Hadith explain that these narrations or this Hadith is not Sahih and the correct version of this Hadith is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels they send prayers upon those who complete the rules who complete the rules and that's a long debate in itself on that hadith, etc. There are many narrations from some of the Sahaba that when they came into the masjid, they would prefer to go to the right side of the row, the right side of the saf, of the imam. However, I personally feel, as some people do, they come in, here's the imam, and everybody comes on this side. And they make a whole big long side, and as such as the masjid is rectangular, and the whole left side is abandoned. I don't think that's correct. You might find someone, he comes on this side of the masjid and he goes all the way to the other side just to get on the right side. I don't think that is what the Prophet ﷺ intended in the hadith, if it's even sahih. Well, I don't think that's what those sahaba intended when they got on the right side of the imam to totally abandon the left side until the right side was totally full. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. That's in brief. Is it a must to read salah? such as Fajr, Maghrib, and Aisha, out loud. Any hadith that talks about that? Yes. His question is very good at one. And I have a feeling I understand where the question is coming from. Is it a must to read or to pray Salatul Maghrib and Fajr and Aisha out loud? Meaning you have to recite out loud. The answer obviously is yes. And what is the proof of that is the uh, maybe hundreds of hadith where the Sahaba they explained about the Prophet's prayer, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that this is how he prayed Fajr, and he read this surah and this surah in Fajr, and that the Fajr of, of Fridays he read Alif Lam Mim Sajda, and he read Surah Al Insan, and like that. That tells you he read out loud. Then he read this surah and this surah at Maghrib, then he read this surah and this surah in Isha. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling Mu'adh, don't make it long for people. When you pray, leading the people in Isha, make it short. Read what duha, what shamsa duhaha, sabbihisma rabbika al-a'la. These hadith, they show you the practical way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And that is what Muslims are supposed to follow, ikhwani. The Prophet doesn't have to say, read it like this. When you pray about it, make sure it's out loud. He doesn't have to say that. Because we are commanded to do what? We are commanded to do what? To follow him, to follow him. So whatever he does, the Sahaba they understood this automatically. But we have a problem with this. This is how you pray. This is how we pray. That's it. This is how you deal with your wife. This is how you deal with your wife. This is how you make du'a. This is how you make du'a. This is how you give the khutbah. This is how you give the khutbah. This is how you sit with people. This is how you sit with people. They used to look at him, and that's it. He doesn't have to talk about it. So when you hear the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And maybe the Sheikh will correct me. In fact, most of the scholars they say the hadith of Kan al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Prophet used to. Kan al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Messenger used to. They say those are more than the actual words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Sahaba describing how he was, what he did, that is more than what he used to speak. Because that is the religion. He was brought to convey and also to do what? to practically be a role model for us to look and follow. So that is the proof. That is the proof. Allahu A'lam. Can you explain the importance of respecting and obeying your mother? We say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned his right, which is Tawheed. That your Lord orders and ordains that you only worship him and none but him. The next thing will be ihsana, and that you treat your parents honorably and respectfully. Imma to the end of those ayat. 
So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned his right, his haq, and directly afterwards he mentioned the human being's haq, and the first human being was the parents, was the parents. So therefore that's clear in the Qur'an al-Kareem, وَعَبُدُ wa تُشْتِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ أَحْسَانًا The verse which is called Ayatul Hukuk, they say in the verse of the ten haq, the ten rights, and the first right of any created being or human being, after the right of Allah the Creator, is the right of the parents. All these things prove the um, yani huge, huge, huge haq that they have over you. And Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Af narrated that the Prophet وسلم, said, says that Allah's good pleasure is in the good pleasure of the parents. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hatred and wrath is in that of the two parents. So if your parents are angry with you and displeased with you, you have to be very careful. That's in brief. Allah ta'ala alam. It says here, what app tells the exact time for prayer? I don't know. I don't use the apps. But I'll tell you something. This is the, uh, an answer for the people, us who live in Toronto. The best way of knowing the time of prayer is the timetable which our brothers at the Quran and Sunnah they made. It's something I know personally because they made this with a practical and actual viewing of the timing, the way it's supposed to be done. So they went up the CN Tower. They actually went up the CN Tower for Fajr and they recorded the timings. And they went up the CN Tower for Maghrib and recorded the timings. And they went up on the CN Tower for Isha and checked the timings. You know, leverage with the actual or with the timetables we had before for the last whatever years. And they made up the timetable we have today which we use here and other masajid have also started to use. You can go to their website and you can find the PDF file there. QSSC.org QSSC.org That's what I use on my phone. I've downloaded the PDF file and that's what we use. That's what we use to pray here also in this masjid. So that's what I trust because I know the people and I know they did this work. As for the other apps, Allahu A'lam. Says question for Sheikh Muhammad. Is there any hadith that talks about panic attacks in women? Is it related with jinn possession if immediately or if, if medically everything is okay? And what are the remedies to cope? <coughs> Say first and foremost, <coughs> I don't know of any hadiths on panic attack being directly related to jinn possession. I don't know of any hadiths that are directly related to panic attacks in women. Uh, Imam al-Bukhari in uh, his book on patients and medicines, yani medicine and in Sahih, he narrates from Tawus, or yani from Ibn Abbas that during the time of the, uh, yani Ibn Abbas he said, Shall I not show you a woman who will be in paradise? And he says, it was this black woman right here. He pointed to her. And he told him of a story that during the time of the Prophet, والسلام, a woman came to the Rasul, والسلام, she says, Inni usra'u wa She says, I suffer from sara'. And the word sara' in the Arabic language can be translated to mean many things. Epilepsy, Jinn possession, any type of mental or yani, psychological sickness or illness which causes a person to have these types of convulsions. And she says, my clothes come <coughs> off and I become exposed. Huh? She said, so invoke that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep me from this. The Prophet والسلام, he says, if you want, I will make dua for you. And if not, he says, sabarti wa lakim jannah. And if not, you can be patient and you will have paradise. She says, bel asbir. He says, I'll be patient. But make dua that what? My clothes won't come off. And the Prophet والسلام, he prayed for her clothes not to come off. The highlighting point from this authentic hadith is what? Is that the Prophet والسلام, he didn't necessarily say that she had a what? A jinn in her. He didn't necessarily say that she was quote unquote possessed with a jinn, even though she had this sara. Okay? So we have terms which are interchangeable. And the word masrur has more than one meaning in Arabic. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's what? Jinn possession. So if a woman has a quote-unquote panic attack or anxiety attack, it does not necessarily mean that there's a jinn in you. It could be. Perhaps. It could be a telltale sign. Perhaps. And Ahl Sunnah al Jama'a, we believe in jinn possession. It's a reality. However, it doesn't. 
And you shouldn't rush into thinking the most negative thought that is gin possession. It could be something else wrong with your physical body, it could be a psychological imbalance, or it could be gin possession. What is important is that, yeah, I need to keep things brief, there are uh, several signs that a person has been afflicted with gin possession or sorcery and things like several signs, and it's not just one thing, an anxiety attack, there are other signs. So therefore, I would say, in brief, just like any type of medical sickness, there are symptoms to a type of sickness. Just because you have one, sick, one symptom doesn't mean you have that sickness. Now you have two or three, and they're strong, different story. Hmm? But just because you have one symptom doesn't mean that. Don't rush to conclusions, and most importantly, just like you go to the doctors, you must go to the heart doctors, the spiritual doctors, the people of knowledge. And there's not no one size fits all answer to this question. What type of attacks do you have? What happens to you? What type of dreams do you have? And the list goes on. Do you have any other pains, any other things that you suffer from? And the list goes on. It doesn't mean that. As far as the remedy, if there is gin possession, that's a long lesson in itself. Most importantly is the dhikr of Allah. First and foremost is to protect yourself. And if your person has been possessed by a jinn or something like this, then there's a way of ridding yourself of that. Reading the Qur'an in general, reading the specific ayat and surah in the Qur'an, such as Ayat al-Kursi, al-Fatiha, Safat, and Surah Taha, and Surah Yunus, and many different ayat and verses that talk about sihr, and talk about jinn, and shayateen, and talk about hasad, and the evil eye, and the shayateen that are evil jinn being destroyed and burnt up. That's the general what? Way. Along with the hadith, which the Prophet used to recite upon himself, what he used to recite upon his children, what he used to recite to his sahaba, and he taught them how to make ruqya and what to say and how to protect themselves. That's the general what? The general ways. And some of the specialists, yeah, I need those who specialize in this type of tip, the tip of Nabawi and ruqya, there are other things that they mention, whether it's zam zam water or pure honey or black seed and uh, zayt zaytun, olive oil, and all types of things that have been proven Islamically and they don't go against the authentic sunnah. That's in brief. Wallahu ta'ala alam. See most of these brothers, they look tired and... Uh, huh? Should we finish off? Sure. Okay, look, they're gonna wake up now. Watch this. Is it haram to eat McDonald's if you believe in Ahl Kitab? You know, that question had to come, right? It had to come. I don't know if maybe you want to answer this, Sheikh. Bismillah. I would say, um, that's the same question. I'll give two things. Number one, I'll give you my personal advice, which isn't a fatwa, it isn't a hukum, and it isn't a ruling. Me personally, I would not advise you to eat McDonald's. Whether they're Ahl Kitab or not, I would not advise you to eat from that restaurant, especially the meat. I wouldn't advise you to eat anything from McDonald's, let alone a hamburger or a chicken sandwich or chicken nuggets. This is my personal advice. Some reasons behind my advice are Islamic. And some reasons behind this advice is personal preference. As far as is McDonald's Ahlul Kitab or not, we say brothers and sisters, as we always say, uh, we don't directly attack, we flank, outflank the enemy. Let's, let's go around that question. Regardless whether the Ahlul Kitab or not, are these animals being slaughtered properly? If a Muslim hits a sheep upside the head or drops a cow into a, uh, a vat of yeah, I need scolding water or freezing cold water or electrocutes, whatever is done to the animal except for dhabah, uh, akar, nahar, etc. The ways of slaughtering an animal are known in Islam. If that animal is killed other than those Islamic ways, then it is meta. It's meta. Whether his name is, uh, what's, the guy, what's the brother's name at the slaughterhouse? Abdul Aziz. Abdul Aziz, or whether the person's name is Robert. This is very important, and many people, they mix the two issues up. It has nothing to do with necessarily Ahl Kitab or not, are the animals being slaughtered properly. If it's a Muslim slaughterhouse, and they cut the animal, Bismillah, Bismillah Nabi, so on and so forth, same thing. Let alone, is he even a Muslim who slaughters other than Allah? 
But the concept is, it doesn't necessarily have to do with Al-Kitab. But the bigger argument at hand is Tariqatul Dhabh. How the animal is slaughtered. That's important. So you just, yani, that's food for thought as we would say. As far as are the Ahl Kitab or not, that's a very long debate. And if once you open up that can of worms, you have to be prepared to open it all the way up. America, America, the history, Canada, Ahl Kitab, Masons, the list goes on. Is it a Christian country or not? Do they worship Allah and believe in Jesus or do they worship, huh? Owls. This is a reality. This is a reality. This is a reality. The concept of North America and the people that came to North America and established the government in Canada and America. We don't get to no conspiracy theories, but this is, once you start debating this, can you say that the Ahmed Gita, are they Christians or are they Shayateen worshippers? So they worship Satan. This is real. If you're not willing to deal with it and discuss it scientifically, then don't even speak about it. And if they say that they're Christians and God we trust and so on and so forth, then leave it as that. What type of Christians? They do this, they do this. Yeah, he, there were types of Christians on the time of the process of them. And the delay that you use to say they are Christians is the delay that was sent down when? The time of when? The Prophet. Muhammad And he said that they were Christians. So yeah, you can't mix and jumble things up. You can't what? You can't mix and jumble things up. So therefore, the concept of Ahl uh, Kitab, the concept of slaughtering the animal, the concept of saying Allah's name or not, these are all khilafat fiqhiyya. Mashhura fi kutub al fiqh wa shuruh al hadith. They have been spoken about hundreds of years ago. And in Queens, New York, Anafis, we did classes on this on udhiyya and on dhabh. And you'll be surprised at some of the statements that you'll find of many of the ulama of the past with regards to mentioning Allah's name or not. Regardless of this, regardless of that, we say what? How are they slaughtering the animals? And we have extremists, those who go and search and research and dig into everything. And then we have people who are totally negligent and don't even care. Do you think they're serving a million people a day with a hand slaughter? So we have to, we have to be balanced. I would not advise to eat from McDonald's or any other restaurant similar to McDonald's. However, be careful. Don't go too extreme, don't go too far, and beware of throwing your opinion upon others. Do not throw your opinion upon others. Do not throw your view upon others. And if you're going to stick to the sunnah of how to slaughter an animal, how the animal should be killed, then you have to stick to the sunnah and everything else as well. And if not, you're contradicting yourself. Some people don't pray, yet they fight over halal and zabiha meat. It's unfortunate. Some women don't wear hijab. Some husbands allow their wives to go outside without no hijab. His daughter is mutabarrijal. Unfortunately, this is sad. And yet still, he sees said, what? It's haram. Brother, I'll leave you with this. We mean, huh? We did what? <laughs> what, was it? Uh, what restaurant was that? It's Wendy's. I think it was Wendy's. Ah, it was a long, long situation. Some time back, we, were, we had to get something for the children. One way or another. Burger King. Uh, uh, Burger King. The lady came to the window. She was Muslim. She said, Assalamu alaikum. She wasn't covered. She said, why are you buying this? The meat is not halal, it's haram. Wallahi. Hey, Nafis, may Allah help him. He's uh, attacking her. Why are you selling it? Why are you selling it? See the point they're trying to get to? Is that if you're sticking with one thing and neglecting something else, it just doesn't make sense. So therefore, my personal opinion, I don't think you should eat from those places. I try my best not to eat, but I don't force that opinion upon no one. Wallahu alam, because it's different ins and outs. There's technicalities with regards to slaughtering, out of kitab, living in America. There's long, long, long issues. Last but not least, there are books on the issue. There are books, several books I have in English that deal with the issue in detail of slaughtering in these western countries wallahu alam hada bi ikhtisar shadid this is in brief wallahu alam there's another branch to that question the brother asks here how about shia meat <laughs> why are you guys laughing it's not funny it's a question as for shia meat then i would say the shia meat is a branch of the shia and yani yani in other words do you consider shia to be muslim all right do you consider Shia to be Muslim? Or with the even more, yani, more someone who's a Rafidi, is he a Muslim or not? If you know that these people who call upon other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invoke the dead, 
hmm? reject what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. Yani, Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said, What? Those who speak about the Sahaba bit tafsiq, let takfir, saying that most of the Sahaba were wicked sinners, then he's what? Yani, if the best of Muslims, kuntum khayru ummatin ukhrijat al nas, if the best ummah, was a ummah of wicked sinners, let alone apostates, then that lies no doubt you have rejected the Quran. Because if they were the best ummah and then afsaq al nas, what about those who come afterwards? So the concept of the rafila, are they considered Muslims or not? We know they're different groups from among the rafila. They're not all on one level. But in most cases, wallahu alam, most of them today, they call upon Hassan and Hussein and Ali, they invoke them. They make dua to them, they slaughter for them, they swear by them. Let alone they deny and they reject that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Quran regarding the bara of Aisha. Let alone those who say that the Quran is distorted. Let alone those who say that Allah didn't know the Sahaba would apostate. And the list goes on of major, major, major problems in Iman and Aqidah, which is Kufr Akbar. So if you consider them to be non-Muslims, then you can't eat their meats because they're not Ahl Kitab. And the fuqaha of the past, the classical madhab, they clearly explain, you cannot eat the meat of an apostate. You cannot eat the meat of a murtad. You can eat the meat of a Jew, of a Christian, when it's slaughtered properly, not of that of one who used to be a Muslim. Just as you cannot marry a woman who used to be a Muslim. You can marry a Jewish woman, a Christian woman, with the conditions, not someone who left Islam, wal-iyadah billah. So therefore, the answer to the question is branched off of what do you think about the rafidah? If you consider them to be still in the circle of Islam, no doubt they're misguided, and that's one thing. If you consider them to be mushrikeen and kafirin, then we say no. Hopefully that's clear, inshallah. And once again, that's it. In brief, iftisar. Wallahu alam. Jazakallah khair. It says, is there any adhkar or surah to recite for one giving bath? Well, I don't understand. What do you mean one giving bath like? For a woman when she's conceived already and she's going to deliver or to conceive. But in both situations, I don't know of anything. I don't know if the Sheikh knows something. Special adhkar or surah for a woman during the time she's about to deliver or to conceive, maybe. Say Bismillah. Oh, Allah help me. As for something specific, and as Abu Umar said, I've never heard of anything mentioned by the people of knowledge that is a specific dua to make one giving birth. I've never heard any of the ulama saying anything about that. Allah alam. He asks here, says, can you give us some pointers to enhance our memory? Taib. Giving pointers on enhancing memory. We've done many videos on this on Hadith Disciple channel. That's first and foremost. Please go back to those videos on how to memorize. As far as right now, first and foremost is seeking help in Allah and leaving off sins. Leaving off acts of disobedience. Abdullah Mas'ud radiallahu he said, Kuna nasta'inu ala hifdi ahadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ma'asi. The way that we used to memorize the hadith of the Prophet was to leave off sin. Leave off acts of disobedience. And we all know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commands in the Quran to lower the gaze. To lower the gaze. And after those ayat about the gaze, about hijab, about who is a mahram and who isn't, Allah speaks about nur. Allahu nur samawati wal ard. Huh? Allah is the one who gives light to the heavens and the earth. And Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he says there's a sir badir, sir balaghi badir. There's a, a, an exquisite secret behind these verses coming like this. And that those who lower the gaze and avoid looking at haram things, Allah will give them the true nur and the firasa and the ability to have what? A quote unquote third eye or sixth sense to distinguish and discern between falsehood and batil. So in other words, true memory and strength of memory, a lot of it is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it comes from you being pious and righteous. And some of strength of memory is something that you're born with, a natural, natural ability. Some people are naturally strong, stronger than others. Some people are naturally what? More intelligent than others. And there's some types of things that you can do to increase your memory. First and foremost, seeking Allah's help, lowering your gaze, avoiding haram acts, Certain foods that you eat that the ulama of the past have mentioned, such as natural honey, such as eating fish, mm -hmm. certain types of gum, certain types of things that you can eat and take, 
that enhance your memory in general. What? In general. And there are other things, foods and drinks, which weaken one's memory. Which weaken one's memory. We just did a video on that in Philadelphia, five minutes of Faida, on memory review and revision. Wallah alam. Says, can you please tell me how to do salam <coughs> when and durud when visiting Medina and our Prophet's grave, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Um, when you go to Medina, the first thing you do is you pray tahiyat al masjid in the in the masjid and Nabawi. You pray two rakahs and better if you can pray in the rauda, even though the scholars again they have ikhtilaf about praying in the rauda. And then after that, you walk towards or in parallel to the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet وسلم, is buried here, and then it is Abu Bakr, and then it is Umar. And you just say, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Rasulullah, may the peace of Allah be on you, O Messenger of Allah. And you move forward, and you say, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Khalifa Rasulullah. You can say, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Abu Bakr. And you move forward, just two steps, two steps for each. Assalamu alaikum, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen Umar. And that's it. That's all you have to do. That's all you have to do, and that's all to there to do. That's all there to do. You don't face the grave to make dua or anything. If you want to make dua, you face the qibla. And the qibla is opposite of the grave. It's opposite. That's all you have to do. Can our Prophet ﷺ hear our salam when we are visiting his grave? Yes. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has given him this um, special trait that when we make salat and salam on him, when you say, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyya Muhammad, Allah brings back his soul and he hears this salam. And the special angels, this is their duty. Allah has special angels who move about the earth. And their duty is to find those people who say the salam, uh, the salatu ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they convey it to him. And that life he is in, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is a different life from what we are in. So you don't try to make analogies. You don't try to make analogies. The life of the barzakh is different from the life of this world. Just like the life of the year after, after the barzakh, after ba'ath, after resurrection, is a different life. Now, Allahu a'lam. He says here, is it abrogated, the hadith of Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhumah, for the azkar after salah in a loud, audible voice? I don't know of any of the ulama who said that it has been abrogated. I've never read any of the ulama saying that that hadith has been abrogated. Rather, the Prophet والسلام, he instructed us to pray as he prayed, before the salah and after the salah. As far as is it abrogated or not, I've never heard any of the ulama saying that it was abrogated. So therefore, if it was me and I finished my salah, I would make my adhkar occasionally from time to time in a relatively loud voice.